part of part of um, understanding and having a knowledge of truth is that you're able to identify and understand and locate where people are, even if they don't know where they are. Right? So here, here's an example. We have we have a lot of folks who want to run around and call themselves sons and daughters and they want to walk in sonship and they want to walk in power, but they don't have a cry. They don't have a cry for intimacy. Like like they can go all day and you know, I mean it's just don't have I don't, I don't want to get into it describing it, but the Bible says, says it like this, that we just go by the word of God. We just go by the revelation of the word that we have, the understanding of the word we have, right? The clarity of the word that we have, right? It says, it says, it says um, we've been given a spirit. That spirit we've been given comes with a cry. It, it comes with a cry. Like, like the spirit comes with a cry. Hey, I'm going to read it for you. Right, this is off the record, Sister Leslie, so don't put this, don't charge this to my time, no. Hmm. <laughs> Oh man, that's funny. Don't charge it to my time, says Uh in uh, uh in Galatians chapter four, verse six, right? It says, and because you are sons, now watch this now. Now we claim sonship. We claim it. I, and I love it. I love it. I love it. We we are we we love we claim in sonship. Even even sonship is not gender specific, right? It's it's a title that was given like that. So so male and female, so sons and daughters. So you, you you can claim sonship speaks to a, a level of power and authority that you've called to walk in. It's through sonship that, that that's God has designed for his kingdom to be extended, right? It's through sonship, right? Um so anyway, uh we claim sonship. Watch this, watch this. It says for Galatians chapter four verse six, because ye are sons, God hath sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts i.e. Holy Spirit, right? Crying. Stop. Crying. I mean, come on now. There should be a cry. Holy Spirit brought a cry. Now, that don't mean you're not a son if you're not crying. That means something's wrong. That means something ain't right. That means something, something's misaligned. My point is the essence of sonship and the true essence of sonship is, is it comes with a cry. Like sonship comes with a cry. We can determine your degree of sonship and where you are in your, in your life of sonship by your cry. Right? I'll come up on a brother and they claim a sonship, but they don't have a cry. Either, either they don't have what they think they have or something's wrong. And I like to give folks benefit of the doubt. Something's missing. Something's wrong. You, you don't, either you don't know something. Either you're not tapped into something. Either you miss a line with something. But it's, it comes with a cry. Like, like the, the, the cry of sonship, the cry of sonship is the cry to be fathered. Abba, Abba. That's what we say Abba, that means father. That's the most endearest term that you can possibly have. It means, it means, it means daddy, I need you. Daddy, I want you. Daddy, I need you. It's, it's a cry for intimate fellowship, which is what characterizes the life of the believer. Okay, so I, sh I shared that to say because if, if you don't want to live the life of, of abundance that God called you, then, then I, I get it. Because the kingdom of God is all about that. That's what the kingdom of God is about. It's about destroying poverty. It's about overcoming sickness and disease. It's about, it's about having a loving marriage. It's about raising wonderful children. It's about being a, hu a heroic husband. It's about life more abundantly. It's about being a blessing. It's about, it's about protection. It's about deliverance. It's about wholeness. It's about so many things that we desire in life. That's why Jesus was so adamant about, man, getting you to repent. Like, like stop. Hold up. Hold up. I need you to stop thinking like that. Because you won't be able to tap into this thing I have for you if you think according to what you the way you used to think, right? So we, we welcome you. We welcome you and we're gonna we're gonna share some things with you that's going to revolutionize. And listen, I know revolutionary revolutionizing a person's mind is not is not easy. Like 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 it's challenging. Like you gotta you gotta be willing to say, wait, 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 I don't know that. Like I think I know it. That's why that's why the scripture says, Blessed are the poor. Like the poor, the poor in Matthew in Matthew's gospel, the fifth chapter says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs are the kingdom. The idea of poor means it means to, to be empty. It means to be needy. It means to be dependent, right? It means it means it, it, it's, it's a twin word with humility. All humility is is, is the ability to, to maintain your teachableness, to be teachable, to be a learner, right? That the kingdom of God. And when you're talking about revolution, you're talking about you're talking about shaking the foundation of what some folks really been believing for a long time. But it needs to be shaken up, right? You're here because you're ready for a revolution. You're ready, you're ready to enter into the divine life that Jesus has for us, right? So we're going to dive into that a little bit later on. Um, first, I want to pray. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for another opportunity to share with those who have ears to hear uh, what it is that you're saying to them from the spirit, from your spirit to their spirit. 
Lord, thank you that my words carry your spirit and they carry your life. And as people receive with meekness this engrafted word, it'll transform them. It'll satisfy that yearning for you that they have. It'll, 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 it'll respond to the cry that's coming from that spirit of sonship that's down on the inside of them. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us. We have everything we need for fully supplying the things that we need in our so great salvation that you've given us. We thank you for this revelation of the kingdom of God and all that it entails and all that it longs to and all that it desires to give us in this life, Lord. We just thank you for the nation of Israel. We pray for the peace of the nation of Israel. We pray for the prosperity of Israel. We thank you for them being your, your honored son, Lord. We thank you for watching over them and keeping them in the midst of their enemies. Lord, we thank you. We pray for the for the for the uh, state of Ukraine, Lord. We pray for the state of Ukraine. We pray that you would watch over and keep those uh, who are who are the um, who are who are the collateral damage, who have who have the innocence, um, and that you bring swift justice. You bring swift justice to those who've caused this detriment and this pain uh, to that people. Lord, we thank you for watching over them and and and, and having a hand, a voice in that situation. Father, we pray for the church of the living God all over the earth, oh Father, that the church would rise to this cry, that would rise to acknowledge the kingdom of God, not in a religious way, that we would, we would, we would make a decision to separate ourselves from this, from this religious, religious environment, from this, from this religious um, um, foundation uh, that has caused the church to miss the mark as it pertains to the kingdom of God. Lord, we just thank you for moving in a mighty way. Uh, in, in, in the church in the earth. And we thank you for the worship center and all the families, the sons, the daughters, the fathers, the mothers uh, that's connected uh, in this group that the blessing of the Lord, we declare the blessing of the Lord being full operation in their life. And we thank you for the operation of the blessing upon our sons and daughters uh, here at the worship center. And we thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. We say amen. Praise God. All right, here we go. Uh, communion. Let's have communion. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. As I was meditating this morning, this scripture jumped out at me. He said, he, he said, Spirit of God says, dive into this thing um, in, a, in, a, in a mighty way. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul was closing, and we've talked about this many times. If you have not been with us, if this is your first time, what if we take communion every single Sunday? I do that because I understand, I understand that the key to you fulfilling your kingdom mandate Yep, kingdom mandate. Ooh, I like that, kingdom mandate. The key to you fulfilling your kingdom mandate is communion. We have the mandate that God gave us way back in the beginning, that Jesus gave us back in John 10, 10, is to live life and life more abundantly. The kingdom mandate that's upon your life can only be fulfilled through communion with Holy Ghost. Through communion. Like without communion with Holy Ghost, you can forget about it. It ain't gonna happen. You just try it, right? You just try it, you just, you, you rolling the dice, you gambling. You rolling the dice, right? So we, 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 we have communion every Sunday as a trigger. I want to trigger you, right? I want to I incite you and remind you on a weekly basis that your communion with Holy Ghost is critical to your fulfilling your kingdom mandate, right? And this, this whole communion table, this whole idea of communion was established by Jesus with his disciples. And he said, this is, this is during that, during that uh, communion service, he says, he says, what you communion with is my blood and my body. And what, what the blood has brought to you and what the body has made possible for you to access once again. That's what he's saying. He's saying, he's saying that, that what I'm about to place before you, what I'm about to go through, but my shedding of my blood and, and, and the surrendering of my body, so that it can be put to death, it's going to give you access to some things. It's going to give you access to the power and the order that comes with the kingdom of God. And if you don't have communion with Holy Ghost, because Holy Ghost's primary assignment, his assignment, when it's all said and done, all, all of the responsibility he's been given as a comforter, no, as the other comforter, because Jesus was our first comforter, Holy Ghost is the, is the continuation of that comfort. He's the extension of that comfort. That's why Jesus said another comforter. Right. I'm here to comfort you. I'm here to bring you into this, this great salvation. But then someone's coming after me. He's going to continue you in this great salvation. Right? He's going to continue the work of what I'm, what I'm initiating. He's going to continue it. He's going to multiply it in your life. And he says his goal, his, 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 his passion is to lead you and guide you into all truth. Right? What's truth? Truth is God's reality for your life. Write that down. Think about it. Say it to yourself. Truth 
It's God's reality. Here's why, here's why I emphasize that, because we, we got this popular saying, well, you know, speak your truth and know your truth and say, no, 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 that, that, you, that truth is the word of God. All that stuff is just, I don't know where folks get stuff from, right? They just come up with stuff in their imagination. That's them your facts, They're not, that's not truth. If it's not associated with the word of God, then they, it ain't truth. It's, he says, he says, he says, uh, he says, he says uh, what is it? Show us thy truth. Thy word is truth. Right? Truth is the word of God. That's truth. Everything else surrounded around that are the facts. Right? So truth, Holy Spirit is, is, is designed to lead you and guide you into all truth, not your facts. But God's reality for your life. God's reality is truth. That's Holy Spirit's assignment. Your, your truth, I'm going to use that phrase, is built into the word of God. Holy Spirit is, is, is uh, desirous to lead you into that truth. But it comes through your communication with him. You gotta know how to commune with him. You gotta know how to commune. Communion is the is a is a trigger. Um, it's something that I want to use to incite you that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then repeat itself. Is is how much you should be communing on those. I'm talking about every second, every minute of your life. It's it's a matter of engaging into the engaging the mind, right? Um, we, <clears throat> we were on our way to. The service this morning and the thought came to me to access the lesson. What, what do people marry? Like our relationship with Holy Ghost is like a marriage. What do we marry? Really, what do we marry? When we marry someone, what are we, what are we marrying? Most folks don't get past the physical. Right? We said this, we said marriage is spiritual. If marriage is spiritual, then it's, it's two-thirds of our, our of our being is spiritual. It's 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 intangible, it's it's not it's not touchable, it's it's not readily seen with the with to with the eye. Well, marriage is spiritual. Our marriage with the Holy Ghost is, is about marrying the mind. It's about marrying the will. It's about marrying the emotions, the desires of a person. Right? When we come together with the Holy Spirit, we're coming together into oneness. Right? So, so communion with the Holy Ghost is just it's about entering into the mind and the thought and the desires. That's, that's how deep communion goes. Right? It's, I, know, I know you've probably been involved with it in a religious manner. You, you know, you go there and you, you pray for you do the thing and you get out on the, on the cushion, you, you know, step and you, and you do what you do with communion, right? You know, only, only, only pastors and, and, and priests and prophets can serve communion, all that stuff, man, that's religion. Don't pay that stuff no attention. Go, go right now to the refrigerator and get you, get you some grape juice, some orange juice, I don't, I, I mean, it may be, this might be, what's this, Kool-Aid? Cranberry. This, this could be Kool-Aid for all I know. <laughs> this cranberry, oh, that's, the, that's secondary, that's secondary. It's the moment. It's the experience. It's the mind. It's the spirit of it. I mean, go get your Oreo cookie. It don't matter what, what it is. It, it, it don't have to be, you know. I, I get the symbolism. But man, if you, if you got an Oreo at the house, go get the Oreo. Go get the oatmeal raisin. Whatever you got. It's symbolic of what it is <clears throat> the moment represents to you. It's intimacy. It's connection. It's love. That's communion. That's what it represents. All of the all the liturgical and pompous and piousness that people brought to it, man, that stuff don't mean nothing. That's just religion. We were talking about love, right? That's communion. Paul says, man, Paul said, listen, he said, listen, he said, listen, I love y'all. When he was talking to Corinthians, like, like Corinthians, that's one of the most, those are one of the most intimate letters Paul wrote. He was pouring his heart out. He was revealing his nakedness. He was telling people how he, what, he, what he prayed and what he dreamed and the, and the pains and the disappointment. He let people get inside of his heart and his struggles. This letter to the, he said, man, I love y'all. I love y'all. I want the best for y'all. That's what he took, that's what he took those letters to, to write about. And then he says this. He says, but listen, but finally, man, I get, this is what I really wanted to get to. He said, I really want to get to this point to where, to where you understood this, that, that you might be perfect and be comforted and, and, and live in peace continuously. He said this, he said, look, the grace of the Lord be with you. That's one. He said, the grace of our Lord. He said, the love of God. And he saved for last the communion of the Holy Ghost. Because this is the most practical expression of our, of our relationship with God in this dispensation that we're in now. This communion with Holy Spirit. So I, wanna, I want this to be a time of communion. You communion with Holy Ghost and, and enter into this, this love affair that, that will lead you into God's reality for your life.
Father, we thank you for um, sending Jesus, being willing to separate yourself from your son, your only begotten, your first begotten, I should say, your first begotten. Your willingness to say, you know, I'm willing to surrender one for all. This, the inverse of Adam being willing to surrender all for one. Jesus surrendered one for all. He surrendered himself for everybody. For the opportunity for us to be reunited with Holy Spirit. To live life based on the terms Holy Spirit reveals to us. Jesus, we thank you for your willingness to be separated and to go through the agony of all agonies. And that was to be separated from the love of your Father. We thank you for being willing to do that. We thank you for being willing to be bruised and battered and beaten and torn. But also to be raised from the dead. To believe, to believe, to believe, to be raised from the dead and be quickened by the Spirit of the God. We thank you, Jesus. And we embrace your body and your death we embrace our inclusion in your death. In Jesus' name, let us eat. Lord, we thank you for the cup, which is the blood of the New Testament, which enables us to commune with the Holy Ghost and be led into truth so that our lives can be a, a testimony to your goodness. We thank you as we partake of this blood, for the cleansing that it brings to our soul, for the cleansing that it brings to our conscience, for the renewing that it brings to our soul, for the renewing, for the refreshing that it brings to our intuition, for the refreshing that it brings to us, for the washing away of shame and sin, of shame and guilt and condemnation, for the obliteration of past misses of the mark. Lord, we just thank you for what the blood means to us and to you. In Jesus' name, let us um, go to Malachi. I want to bring. I want to bring this thought out about the tithe. And I can't dive into it as much as I'd like to, but. Um, I want to bring some clarity to, I want to bring some clarity to the, the design of the tithe and what the tithe was designed to um, be in our lives because there's so much confusion as it relates to it and I believe this confusion have, has left so many believers in poverty and, it, and it's positioned us to become, it's, it's positioned us to be to, be, to have an expectation that is, that, is, that is impractical, unrealistic, and it's not anything that God intended for us to have. The expectation of what the tithe is supposed to bring to our life, right? Um, so I, I want to read it first. In, in, in uh, Malachi, the third chapter, uh, let's start at verse uh, 10. It says, bring you all the tithe to the storehouse, that, it may be, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now, he would say of the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. And I will rebuke the devourer for thy sake, and he shall not destroy the fruit of thy ground, neither shall thy vine cast forth before the time, and, and time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, and ye shall be, the, be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Right? And the part I want to I uh, magnify is the tithe, the tithe, has traditionally been taught. Okay, wait, wait, I gotta back up, right? So when you're thinking about the the uh, salvation, right? Salvation is a five-fold, five-tiered me mechanism or five-tiered um, uh, institution, we can call it. And uh, with the first aspect of that is wealth creation. When you think about God and how he, how he hates poverty, how he is not the originator of poverty, how Satan is poverty, how Satan's whole drive and life and goal is to impoverish you. Uh, we're going to talk about both of these things. In John 10, 10, Jesus told you that he comes to, to bring you in, put you in poverty. And then he said, he said um, um, also we talk, about, we talk about God's hatred for, for you to be empty. Satan was stripped of all of his splendor and his glory. He was poverty. He was the manifestation of poverty, and he wants everybody else to be impoverished. 
God hates poverty. So part of the first aspect of our salvation is wealth creation. God has a wealth creation strategy that he wants you to enter into. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you into that strategy. Well, well that wealth creation strategy is, a, is, is made up of a, a, tri, a triune um, components, right? Making, managing, and multiplying money. Now, these three compartments must be understood and must be properly um, um, operated within, right? There's things that we do to make money. There's things we do to manage money. There's things we do to multiply money. There's instructions we've been given to make money. There's instructions we've been given to manage money. There's instructions we've been given to multiply money, right? There's capacities we've been given to make money. There's giftings, there's callings, there's mindsets, there's belief sets, there's things that we've been given, there's tools, there's skill sets that we've been given to make money. But then there's also uh, strategies that God has given us to multiply money, I mean, to, to manage money. And there's also strategies that God will give us to multiply, right? So we have to properly compartmentalize those things. I can't take a my 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 uh, a, a, a characteristic that I've been given to make money and try to apply it over into the multiplying money field or category. It 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 won't work over there, right? I can't take what the strategies that I've been given to multiply money and try to use it to make money. It won't work properly. It won't function properly in that category, right? I can't take a mechanism that I've been given to manage money and try to apply it to multiply money. It won't it won't properly function in that particular compartment. Well, when it comes to the tithe, the tithe has been traditionally appropriated to the grown compartment. We've, we've traditionally taught the tithe to be a compartment for making money. When technically the tithe is a money management, a part of the money management system that God has for us. Why, why, was, why must we distinguish that? Because if I teach you that the tithe is a apparatus, here's how it goes. When you bring the tithe, God's going God's to gonna, God's gonna bless you, right? We use that word blessed ambiguously, right? In, in other words, God's going to make you wealthy. When you, when you bring the tithe, when you bring your tithe, God's going God's to gonna give you that job. Or God's going to, you know, uh, bring somebody, gonna, somebody can send you a check. Whatever, whatever, we, we, whatever we say, how we, how we characterize, how we describe it as a, a mechanism for God to make you money or to cause money to come to you. I get that. I'm not going to argue with you about that, right? But really, really, the precise way the tithe was intended to be used was as a, as a management mechanism, right? The people were cursed with a curse, right? In other words, they, the, the idea of being cursed with a curse is, is they, they, they barricaded themselves from the goodness of God, right? When you, when, you, when you don't tithe, you barricade yourself and you don't allow the flow of life, the flow of, of salvation to, 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 to arrest your life. And so, so God was saying, listen, you need, to, you, need to remove, you need to remove yourself from up under this curse and enter into the, the blessing or the, the uh, operation of the tithe that, that is all about management. It's about you taking what you, what you make to come in and properly managing it by, by giving God a certain percentage. By bringing, by bringing, by bringing before the Lord uh, so that... So that the, the inspiration behind your ability to make it, the source behind your ability to make it, is properly acknowledged. Remember, remember back in Deuteronomy 8.18, he says, listen, it's me that gives you the power to make it, to get it, right? He says, don't forget about me now. When I bring you out of that poverty, when I bring you out of that, that, that desperateness, when I bring you out of that debt, when I bring you out of wherever you are, and I bring you out of that, don't forget about me now. Now you got to manage what I've given you. Here's the first step in managing it. Bring me 10% of it. Add, 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 what, add a free will offering to it. Right? Now you're properly managing it. When you mismanage, when you mismanage what God has given you, it affects making it. It affects multiplying it. When you mismanage it, it affects how you make it and it affects how you multiply it. But the idea that the tithe belongs in the making money compartment or wealth creation compartment is not accurate. We gotta bring it over in here. We gotta we gotta manage it. So you, you might have someone who's doing great making money, but they're not properly managing it. Right? Uh, their, their management, their management is, is definitely is going to affect, they can even be doing greater. Right? But the, the management part of the tithe, and, and I, I thought about that, I said, well, I want to bring some clarity. Bring clarity to people's mind when it comes to the tithe is not designed to, to make you money. 
That's why people sit back here and they wait because they feel like they're tired. They're waiting on the Lord. The Lord, the Lord got me. The Lord going, one day it's going to happen. One day I'm going to come out of this poverty because the Lord going to do something mighty. Nope. He's already done something mighty. Right? He, he, he wants you to believe right. You got to believe right. You got to have the right mindset. You got to have the right, you got to discover your gift set. You got to have the right tools. Set. You got to have the right skill set. You got to know how to market. You got to know how to pump it. You got to know how to pump it. Like, like, there's a lot. There's a lot to making it. Right? There's a few things that go into making it. But then managing is a whole nother deal. Right? So I want you to have some clarity on it. When you bring your tithe today, when you give your offering today, understand that you're properly managing, you're being a proper steward of what it is God's giving you. And because of that, He's going to protect your assets. He's going to protect your money-making assets. Remember, he wanted to, he wanted to, uh, he rebuked the devourer for your sake, right? The devourer was one who would come and devour the crops. When you, when you devour, when you devour the crops, and when you spoil the crops of a people whose entrepreneur endeavor is agriculturally funded, now you, now you affecting, you affecting what they can make. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll destroy the devour for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your vine, the fruit of the ground. He shall not destroy what you, what you grow out of the ground, he won't destroy. The business you're building, the product you're selling, the service you're offering, the course you're creating, the church, you're, the apparel you're selling, the management system you're, you're propagating, all of that stuff. He says, I'm going to protect it so that, so that it, it brings forth what it's supposed to bring forth. Right? It's, a, it's a management system, right? which affects your making system, which then will lead to your, your, your ability to multiply. When he said, he said, all nations shall call you blessed, right? and you shall be a delightsome land. That's multiplication. So yeah, the tithe is it's powerful, but listen, it's got to be properly appropriated in your life. When you, when you are properly appropriated, it's going to start operating the way it's supposed to operate. And you'll get the results that you desire. Right? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give toward the the, the, the preaching and the teaching of the kingdom of God. But that's all we're about. It's preaching and teaching the operation of the kingdom of God and the lifestyle that we're called to live. Lord, we thank you that we can be this and do this and bring this before you. And we fully expect the operation of our stewardship to be manifested in how we make it, manage it, and multiply it. We thank you for giving us the um, assets and resources necessary to overcome poverty. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, uh, I want to I wanna make one quick announcement. We pre-launched, we pre-launched, this, this is all to my husbands and my wannabe, soon-to-be husbands and wannabe husbands. We started our pre-launch yesterday. I'm so excited about our uh, Heroic Husbands Challenge. We launched, we pre-launched, I should say, our Heroic Husbands Challenge. It wasn't open to the public, but it's going to be open to the public starting next month. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna promote it, we're going to put it out there, and people are going to have an opportunity to, to engage in this community of husbands that are on fire to be heroes, to be viewed as heroes to their wives, to their children, and to their, to their community, like, like a heroic husband. And we break it down. It is very much a possibility for husbands to be viewed as heroes, and we get we got into what it means to be a hero. We have did, we have we have broken it down into the six pillars of a heroic husband. The six pillars, man, you, you don't want to miss it. Um, we're gonna start promoting it next month. So if you know any husbands, if you know any want to be husbands, they need to be a part of this community because it's going to prepare them if they're not married, but it's gonna also uh, continue to empower them if you are married. It's gonna empower you to become that heroic husband and have an impact on. It has an impact domestically on your family, uh, uh, socially on the community, and economically uh, on, on, on everything around you, on everything around you. So uh, we, I want to make that announcement. Uh, be on the lookout for um, promotional, be on the lookout for posts, be on the lookout for everything we put on our social media that is, that is, that is um, revealing that heroic husband that's inside of every man that desires and that wants to be married. You need to be a part of this community so that you can be prepared to, to bear the weight, uh, the light burden of husbandry, right? So we had a great time yesterday. I wanted to make that announcement. Um, God bless you to all those guys who's a part of it. Um, now, let's dive into this thing. We are ready to go into the kingdom of thy kingdom come, the why behind our cry. I want you to go to Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter. You go to Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, um, and we're going, we're going to.
Sister Leslie, I need this thing to be activated. Um, I don't know why it does this. Matthew's got to the sixth chapter, where we where we we're going to pick up from where we left off, as it pertains to this uh, this cry, this prayer. Uh, you just got to you got to do it. Got to go out, exit out. Um, the cry, the cry behind our wife. And what we're dealing with is is Jesus's is is Jesus's. Um, or what we get, what we're getting at, is the practicality or the outworking, the outworking of what Jesus came, what Jesus came to declare to us. Um, and he, Jesus defined why he came. He defined why he came. His definition to why he came is clear. John ten ten. I told you, or we mentioned earlier. That, that the enemy is all about impoverishment. He's all about bringing the poverty. The, the idea, remember he says, to steal, to kill, and destroy the idea of stealing is the, worst, it, it's, it's the idea of to felch from. It means to slowly take from to where there's nothing left. That's poverty. It's to steal. It's to kill. When he, when, he, when he puts you in poverty, then he kills your faith, your love, your hope. He takes that away. He wants to kill and then finally destroy. The idea of destroy means to completely obliterate. He don't even want there to be any trace that you ever existed. Like that's how evil the idea of Satan is. That's how evil it is. He wants, to, he wants you to live in poverty. If he had his way, he'd have you live in poverty to the point of dying. And to the point of obliterating. So in other words, he don't even want there to be any 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 um, evidence that you ever existed. What does that mean? He don't want you to have any children. He don't even want you to be, he don't want you to exist, ever existed at all. That, that's how wicked and evil Satan's mind is. That he wants you poor, he wants you to die, and he wants you to have no evidence or trace that you ever existed in the earth. Well, Jesus said, listen, I, I come to do the opposite, baby. I come, I come to give you something. He said, I am come. He says, the Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He says, but I am come that you may have life not just have it a little bit, but have it in abundance. Have it in abundance. And when he was talking about life, he was speaking specifically about this term zoe, right? It's the term zoe. And it's the idea of life on four dimensions. It's the idea of life. The idea of life is, is first a intimacy, a love affair, a communion, a communication with God Almighty. A level of intimacy that is, that is, that is, um, that is designed to propel you into, into the life God has called you to live. So that intimacy begins with God Almighty. It, it, it is manifested through Jesus in our relationship with him and it's, and, it's, and it's complete in our intimacy with Holy Ghost. It's a love affair. It's a passionate, vehement love affair. It's a fight to love. It's a desire to express and be affectionate. It's a love affair. It's, 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 it's expressed in our worship. It's expressed in our heart. It's expressed in our cry for him. That is what that is what that love affair is all about, which then leads to spilling over into my love for God's people and my love for the community God has called me to. It spills over into how I now want to be a creator. I want to be so creative. I want to ex uh, uh, ignite my creative juices so that now I become a solution. Right? I become a solution. The idea of manliness, the idea of entrepreneurialism, the idea of godliness is to be a solution, is to bring solutions to people's problems. So we're about bringing solutions. That's Zoe. I'm still talking about Zoe now. I get it. I know. I'm still talking about Zoe. You thought Zoe was when you get to heaven. No, Zoe is right now. That's kingdom. We're talking king. We're not talking religion. We're talking king. Zoe is right now. Right? Now, once you, once you become a creator, now you have to become a producer. Right? We're talking about... We're talking about um, the kingdom mandate that God told way back in the beginning. We, we, we just put it in different words, right? Now we're talking about being a producer. And then you're talking about after you produce it, as you, after you manufacture it, after you put it all together, as you manifest it, because creating is, is, is a spiritual thing. Now that you produce it, that's a natural thing. That's a, that's a manifesting. Like God created man, but then he formed him. Two different things. We create solutions, then we produce those solutions. We come up in our we come up in our mind a, a particular product and a service and we all and we package it and we put it together but but I'm sorry we come up in our mind we discuss it we brainstorm it we think it out we critically think it out we, we, we think about the solution and then we manifest what we thought out like God created man but then He formed them with the dust of the ground He created them with words then He formed them with dust you create solutions with your mind with your words with your imagination but then you produce it with natural resources 
then you serve man. You serve by you serve by selling first, right? Selling is a God thing. It's a God ordained thing, right? From from your gifts and talents to your products and services, we sell those things. Then we can get into sowing. After we after we've sold it and we've created wealth, now we get into sowing. Zoe, that's life. That's life. That's how the thing is supposed to go. Right? When Jesus said, listen, he said, repent. The idea of repentance is returning, return to the original way of thinking, the way God intended for you to think, the way God intended for you to function. Think the way I intended for you. That means we got to go back, we got to go back, we got to go back. We got to go back, back, back. We got to go back to the beginning. Right? When you go back to the beginning, now you, un, now you, now you get the clear picture of, man, this, man, this, this, this is how we're supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to function. Because now we're dealing with the root cause of why we're, why we're in poverty, why we're sick, why we're diseased, why we have confusion and chaos and war and fighting all the stuff that we have. Because Jesus said, listen, I need you to change that way because, because this kingdom thing I got for you, not only does it come with a crime, but it comes with abundance. It comes with peace. It comes with joy. It comes with so much power to bring order. Right? The kingdom of God is what God is designed to bring order to your life. Control of your circumstances. That's the kingdom. Like that's what it's about. So when Jesus said this, he says, when we talk about the we talk about the king, that kingdom come, he, when we pray that kingdom come, when we pray that kingdom come, when we're crying for that kingdom to come, we're crying for power and order. We're crying for it. So in this particular, in this particular uh, uh, context, in Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, uh, the disciples, they wanted, they said, Lord, teach us, teach us, teach us how to pray. See, John taught his disciples how to pray. He said, no, no, teach us how to pray. And this was a common ask of disciples because in their mind, they understood that prayer, prayer is, was the key to the functionality of their life. Prayer is, prayer is that link. Prayer is that piece to the puzzle that causes life to have a flow that causes you to flow into the rhythm of the spirit of life that God has called you to. See, prayer is that, is that mechanism that enables you to have harmony with the spirit of God. Prayer is that thing that enables you to flow in the rhythms of life that God has called you to live. That's what prayer is. Prayer positions you to be able to recognize the opportunities that God brings before us so that we can seize them. See, prayer is so much more than me going before God thinking he don't even know what I'm asking him, but I'm about to ask him. That's how some folks go to prayer. Jesus clarified it. He, he clarified it. He said, some folks go to prayer thinking, man, man, I'm going to make God aware of what's going on in my life. Like, he don't know. Right? That, if you take that approach to prayer, you, you never get answers to your prayer. Because you're not coming with the right mindset. You're not coming with the right spirit. Right? So Jesus, we talked about that. Let, let, let me move on. He says, it says uh, they, he says this. He said, listen. He said, I'm going to teach you how to pray. He said, when, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner, street corners that they may be seen of men. So, so what would happen, folks would go in the marketplace. Now this is going to sound very familiar to what you know some folk to do. They would go into the marketplace and you know when the, when the Pharisees, when they, when they, went, when they, went, they went in droves, right? they, went, they went with a crew. And, and people would move out of the way and you know, people would make way for the Pharisees and they would go and they would, they would, they would post up on the corner and they would stand with all of their, 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 um, their, their robes and their, their priestly garments and their pious garments. And they would, so, so, so they would make a big show of it. And then they would stand there and they would pray these long, repetitive, liturgical, pious type prayers. And then all that day, man, they, get, they, they get what they want right there. That lets you know where their heart is. It's when they go on before folks because they want, they, want, they want to impress men by how they pray. He said, this, but when you pray, he said, no, you go in your closet. See, prayer is an intimate thing. Prayer is a thing that's supposed to be done like, like behind closed doors. Like prayer is an opportunity for you to pour out your soul before the Lord. Remember Hannah, when Hannah prayed? Hannah, the, the, the Bible describes Hannah prayer. She, she was pouring out her soul. She was pouring out her pain. She was talking about her hurts. She was talking about she was talking about stuff that made her cry. She was talking about that thing she went through. Like she was pouring her confusion, her uncertainty. She was pouring out her soul. Like you don't just do that in front of anybody. That's prayer. Lord, I need some answers. Lord, I need to know what's going on. Why am I feeling like this? Why am I going through this? Help me to understand me. That's prayer. The folk ain't praying. They ain't coming from their belly. They ain't coming from their heart. 
See, there's a, there's a dimension of prayer where you get where you don't even want nobody around. You don't want nobody to hear you. You don't want nobody to know what you're going through, what you're fighting against, the fears, the uncertainties, the, the fright that you're dealing with. You don't want nobody to know that stuff. That's between you and God. He said, go in your closet. Pray that thing out. Shut the door. Intimacy. Privacy. Pray to that Father, which is, which is in secret. See, God is in secret. And the idea of God being in secret is God being in that innermost chamber of your heart. Right? The idea, when you think about God who, who's in secret, think about the holy place. Think about the tabernacle. The outer court, the inner court, and the holy place. Or the most holy. Think about that. Because that's, that's the inner chamber. What takes place in that inner chamber? See, if we want to really understand that, we got to go to David. Because David was the one who, who introduced us to that, that holy place of love and worship, right? The shadow of the Almighty being in that secret place. He says, go to, the, go to your secret place. Your Father which is in secret, which see it in secret. So he knows what's going on even in your secret place. And the beauty about God is, is when, you, when you acknowledge that secret place and when you go and you fellowship with him in that secret place, when you have that, 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 that place that's, that's reserved for him and you to get in that, get in that place and go at it and, and love and, and talk and communicate and express. When you got that place for him, when you do that thing privately, he then will reward you publicly. He going to make sure people know this is my son, this is my daughter. They belong to me. He going he gonna to make sure that you get that thing that you've been going after. He going to be sure that you have the public praise of men. He going to be sure that you're favored. He going to be sure that you're great. He going to be sure that you're forgiven. He going to be sure that this door opens. When you do that thing publicly, though, he said, you got it. You, got it. you take it. You, you run it. Ain't going to bother. He going to let you do what you want to do. But when you, when you do it secretly, but he's going to be sure, right? He's going to be sure, right? He says this, and don't use vain repetition. Don't think that when you say stuff a hundred times that you're going to get it. As heathens do. So he dealt with the religious, and then he dealt with those folks who don't know him. Heathens were those who had no communication with God. Those who were separated from the commonwealth of Israel, those who didn't have a relationship with him. He said, heathens, they think they're going to be heard for their vain repetition because they, because they talk a lot. Right? They think they're going to be hurt because they use all their words. No, that, that, don't, that don't mean nothing. Right? He says, but, 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 but be ye not like unto them. For your heavenly Father knoweth the things, watch this, you have need of. We talked about the difference between needs and wants. You have need of. He says, but before you ask. He says, this is the matter, therefore you pray. First thing he said. He said, first thing you got to know that God is about supplying your need, not your want. Like, like you got you to, you, see, first of all, the idea of fatherhood. The idea of fatherhood. See, fathers are responsible for implying to you and restoring to you and, and supplying to you what you need to be the man you're supposed to be or the daughter you're supposed to be. We focus on, we focus on supplying your need. Most folks, when they go to God, they go to God for what they want. So you might, you might, you might want a new car, but what you need is the ability to make money to go and afford and maintain the new car. So God's going to give you an idea. God's going to give you, he's going to bring to your attention the, 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 the gift. And he's going to bring you a word that's going to cause you to move in this manner or cause you to, to market your product over in this particular area so that you can create the wealth so that you can go and buy the car cash or, or flat out without payment so that you, it didn't give you the ability to manage it. But you just want God to show up, somebody to show up and do with some keys. God is into sustained Deliverance, not quick fixes, not one dones, but sustainable processes that's going to keep you in, in, in deliverance, sustainable processes that's going to keep you in peace, sustainable processes that's going to keep you in, the, in, in love, right? So that's what God is into. So when you go before God with what you need, be, be, be ready, to, be ready to, to, to get something that's going to cause you to do something. He says this, your heavenly father knows the thing that you have need of. Don't go before God thinking about to make him aware of what you're going through in your life. You're going to be off from the very beginning. He says, well, this is the matter that you pray. First of all, you got to see him as a father. A loving father who, as, as, as um, the word says, if you ask for a uh, fish, will they give you an egg? Like, no. But you know the things that you have need of before you ask. How, how, how restful, how reposing is that? Oh, Lord, you know the things that I have need of. 
make me aware of what I need. That's the first thing we pray. Make me aware of what I need. Right? He says, he says, as a father, you know what I need. As a father, you know what I need. Come to him as a father. Then he says this, hallowed be thy name. The idea of hallowing the name of the Lord. The idea of exalting the name of the Lord. Hallowed be thy name. That word name is actually plural in his original language. The names of God. Specifically speaking, the covenant names of God. It's, it's knowing God. See, see, when you approach God and you need peace, you've got to approach him as Jehovah Shalom. When, you, when you're looking to be right about something, you have to approach him as Jehovah Sidkenu. When you're looking to be um, delivered from something, you've got to approach him as Jehovah Rohi. Right? There's, there's these different names that Jesus came to reveal, these different aspects, these different compartments of who God is as a person, as a personality. He came to reveal all those things. He said, I reveal unto them thy names. Plural. The names represents the identity of who God is. Jesus identified with being several things when it came to his being. Well, he says, hallowed be thy name. So we have to know the names of our Lord. We have to know Jehovah. We have to know Jehovah Sikkim. We have to know Jehovah Rapha. We have to know Jehovah Jehovah. We have to know all of the names, the covenant names that God has identified himself as so that we can relate to him in that fashion. He says, first you got to see him as a father. Then you got to hallow who he is. Then he said, that came to God. Then he sandwiched that with, so that that world can be done in the earth as it is in heaven. The reason we cry for the kingdom of God is so that the will of God can be done. See, we want the will of God to be done without the kingdom of God being established. It will not happen. Let, let, let's look at this. I want to read it. I, I, I got something I want to get to as it pertains to that, but I want us to go to Isaiah. Because this is, this is very important. Isaiah was giving us insight to the coming of the Lord and what the coming of the Lord would bring or would mean to his people. He said this, uh, they, the people were in bondage at this particular time. He says, nevertheless, the, 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 this, the, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. Uh, this, this, he's speaking of the people of God, right? When the first he lighted, he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephetim. Nephetim. And afterwards, oh, and afterward did more general, grievously affect, afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. It says, the people that walk in darkness have seen great light. Right? We, we saw that, we hear that quoted over in Matthew. It says, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath, hath the light shine. Speaking of the manifestation of Jesus. Verse 3 says, thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy, the joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. So he was speaking of the joy that people have in harvest. They had an experience. He says, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. So again, he's speaking of the joy that comes when men have the harvest and they divide the spoil. Then he says, for thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. He's speaking of the people of God having their, having their yoke and their burdens broken. Having, I'm sorry, has broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of, of his shoulders. The yoke and the burden that was upon his shoulders, he's broken off, right? And now he's causing them to come into this, 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 what he's going to talk about. He says, for every battle of the war is with confused noise. The garments are rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And now he's speaking about the warfare that's going to take place, that's going to bring liberation to the people. Then he says, it's for unto us a child is born. Now he's talking about that deliverance that God has for us. It's going to come through a child that was born of a virgin. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. So he's talking about the process of a child going into entering into sonship. Right? God gave us his first begotten son. He gave us his first begotten son. Unto us a child was born, but then God gave us his son. And the government is upon the shoulders of this, of this son. That word government there speaks of rulership, authority, um, the ability to bring order. He says the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called. Then it goes through the, um, the characteristics of the expression of the person. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of salvation. I repeat the word for salvation. He's the prince of salvation. He says of the increase of this 
rulership, this dominion that leads to the fivefold expression of salvation, which is wealth creation, health, maintenance, protection, deliverance, and wholeness. Those five aspects. Those five aspects is what Jesus came for us to bring. It's what life more abundantly will lead us into. Wealth creation, health, maintenance, protection, deliverance, and wholeness. He says, he says, the government, so the government of God, the rulership of God, the kingdom of God is the, how we characterize this government, will lead us into the fivefold dimensions. It is called, it's designed to cause us to govern our lives in such a way that there'll be a manifestation of these five dimensions of our great salvation. That's what we cry for. That's what we yearn for. That's what we look for. He says, rulership, dominion. This takes us back to the beginning. He says, and the peace of this fivefold, he says, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David. David, as I said earlier, speaks to intimacy. It speaks to the oneness of the spirit that David had with God. So the, the kingdom of God is designed to bring us into a oneness in spirit, a oneness in mind, a oneness in action. Upon this, so to, to bring order and to establish justice and judgment in the land. Henceforth and forevermore. It says the zeal of the Lord. That word zeal is actually the word jealousy of the Lord of hosts will perform. That's what Jesus brought to us. When we talk about the kingdom of God over here in the New Testament, that's what we're talking about. You're talking about a governmental structure, an order of how you order and operate every single thing in your life. That's kingdom of God. That's, 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 that's um, learning, that's uh, being aware, that's uh, being knowledgeable, that's being understanding, that's having a level of wisdom so that you can properly appropriate and operate and function in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a governmental structure. It models, it models a particular uh, components of heaven, right? There's a will of God that God wants to be manifested in the earth through us and in us. But before we get to that, before we get to the will of God, before we get to that place where we're operating and functioning in that will of God, then we have to have this kingdom thing in order. My time is up. Wednesday, we're going to talk about some things that's crucial to the kingdom of God. As every natural kingdom comes with its characteristics, so does God's kingdom. And the most important characteristic that the kingdom of God comes with is culture. 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 We're going to break down the kingdom culture. Because once you, once, I'm telling you, once you, once you enter into this kingdom culture, you can put things on cruise. Because the culture will cause you to think It'll cause you to speak. It'll cause you to behave. It'll cause you to possess everything God wants you to possess. Because we know as a man thinking, that's what he will do. But the culture of the kingdom of God is so rich, it's so full of who God is and what God has for you. You enter into it, you can put life on cruise. But I got it. I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, watch this with us. God has something that he wants to bring to your life. He has something he wants to see manifested in your life. But listen, his hands are tied, like he's finished, right? We, like like, like when, we don't, when we don't embrace the kingdom of God, we want to hold on to the things that we've learned in our life in the world. We want to hold on to, 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 to um, you know, carnal ideologies and, and, and philosophies. We, we, we tie the hands of God. We handcuff God. I would, that's what the scripture says, the children that they turn back. They stayed, they kept focused on what they what they were what they had in Egypt. They kept focused on, on, on them and, and what they learned. And it says they limited the Holy One of Israel. They handcuffed him. Right? They prevented him from fully manifest. Like we do the same thing today where we don't embrace the kingdom of God and believe like we're supposed to believe. Limit him. Stop limiting God by looking back and wanting to hold on to the traditions of man. Listen. I want to thank you for taking the time to spend with us. If, we, listen, if we've said anything that's enlightened you, that added value to you, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to subscribe if you're watching by YouTube. I need you to like. I need you to follow us on all our social media sites. I need you to do it. 
Let us know how much this has added value to your life. If you're watching by Facebook, let somebody know to be here Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Because we're going to continue diving into that kingdom come. The why behind our crime. Remember, sonship comes from the crime. Thank you. God bless you. We love you. And we will see you Wednesday night.